Few companies in the world understand the word brand like Nintendo. There's a good chance you'd know a game as Nintendo, even if they released it in the dead of night with no trademark or copyright in sight. You'd know it from the eye-popping playground and candy colors, or the weird and wonky noises, or maybe the fact that the main character kinda just yells to communicate. You'd know it for most, well, maybe even all major Nintendo series, except one. Metroid is Nintendo's black sheep. It's the odd woman out in one of the straightest-faced crowds in gaming. That oddness was by design. Driven by internal rivalry in the company, Gunpei Yokoi pushed the Metroid team to make a game unlike anything Miyamoto had done. Throw out the colorful dinos and bring in the aliens. Literally, the sci-fi classic Alien was a direct inspiration to the series. Metroid's antagonist, Ridley, is named after Alien's director, Ridley Scott. Mario is all sunshine. Metroid is all the dark and eerie empty of space. In daring to be different, Metroid became a massive critical success and very influential. Metroid created a new style of level and world design. An entire gaming genre would come up half from Metroid, half from Castlevania, Metroidvania. And yet, Metroid hasn't quite sold to its critical success, never breaking 3 million units and rarely breaking 1.5. Nintendo never understood what to do with its odd kid. They botched release schedules, missed major region releases, and sometimes simply didn't believe in the title enough. At this point, reading the title of this video, you might be asking why all of this matters. It's because in the wider world, and in Smash, Nintendo rarely seems to know what to do with Samus in Smash. Hey guys, Bonk here, and before we get into all that, if you find that you don't know what to do with Samus, head over to ProGuides.com, check out a character guide, a pro guide, or even get direct coaching. Now on to the show. Okay, so the best place to start is with Samus' original design. Samus was unique right down to the base stats. She was a weird combination of heavy and floaty. It's weird in any Smash game, but particularly in Smash 64. The original Smash has a very combo-friendly engine, so the norm is that most characters give and take long strings. But Samus both can't combo as heavily or be comboed as heavily. It's partially because of how floaty Samus is, but it's also because Samus's up special is really good for combo breaking. Samus's down special can also prevent combos and stall aggression, however, Samus's disadvantage is still not the best. Mainly because in 64, there are no tether recoveries. That means Samus and Link's recoveries are rough. 64 Samus can still die very early to edge guards, and unlike Fox, she doesn't have insane drift on her up special to mix things up. The lack of a side special missile also hurts Samus's keep away ability. However, Samus's other specials were firsts for Smash. Her charge shot was the first charged long range projectile, and her down special is still unique for how it helps her stall and makes her harder to hit. Her aerials are even more unique and the true core of her kit. Samus's aerials give her a lot of control in neutral. They're all pretty large for 64. Forward air in particular can be hard to interfere with and lead to combos with Z-canceling. Back air is large enough and strong enough that it can be used to wall out and get kills. A bit like melee puffs bear. Up air, in combination with up special, make for great shield breaks and pressure. And then there's down air, which opens up an opponent like they're a multicolored door you just backtracked half the map to get to. Combine all these factors together and you had an interesting but not that successful character. For a lot of 64's lifespan, Samus has been at the bottom of most Smash Backroom tier lists. The slow zoner archetype she and Link were in didn't seem to fit in a game that lacked defensive tools. Samus actually fell to last when Isaiah put in work with Link. Samus would rise up the tier list as the stage bans hurt certain other low tiers more than her, and as she picked up a few new players, mainly Hammer Heat, NTA, and one of Smash 64's best casters, Cobra. Samus also put in good work as a secondary. She could contend well with some characters like Puff. She could go air to air and get hard fair cancel punishes. And Samus's potent shield break setups could drop Puff out of the air like she was a little pink Metroid. Samus reached 8th on the last Smash Backroom tier list in 2015. The Bounty Hunter does great in advantage, chasing and cornering her target, but she struggles to get advantage started. Her laggy tether grab and floatiness means she doesn't have the speed or tools to get great offense started. 
So she lands 8th on the tier list. Or, well, in the US at least. In Japan, you might be convinced to think differently by the world's best Samus and biggest hidden boss. This player is Josuke, named after the JoJo character. He's more unranked than hidden, as he's in some of Smash 64's most viewed VODs. Josuke is unranked because he doesn't travel, but his results in Japan suggest he could be a top 10 player. He regularly makes top 8, if not top 2, at major Japanese tournaments, and he shows a side of Samus that no American player shy of Isaiah has shown. His reaction times are insane, and he uses them to create down-air tech chases that make Samus look like Melee Falco. His SDI is nuts, so he'll fall out of moves, then up special to reverse the scenario. And his punishes are so insanely optimized that you'd think Samus has one of the best combo trees in the game. He's taken sets off of several top-ranked players, including Wario, Wangara, Kuraba, and Kikoshi. And he covers Samus's bad approaches in a novel way. Bye not approaching. If he can, he'll just wait, then punish. Hey, look, he's Josuke, not Jotaro. But even with Josuke, Samus might still be a low tier. Josuke's nearly as good with other characters, and even with Josuke's optimizations, Samus feels off. She defies some of the game's central combo logic. She's super heavily indexed into tech chases and pressure, but she doesn't have many tools to actually get that pressure started. However, 64 Samus isn't the true origin for the character's career in competitive Smash. She goes back all the way to the very early Melee tournaments that gradually kickstarted the eSport, starting with a player named Wes. Wes was Melee's best Samus and a top 10 level player during the game's early years. He was part of why the Bounty Hunter climbed from 9th in the 3rd tier list to 6th in the 4th and 5th tier list. Samus had certainly improved in Melee. She found a few upgrades and one big missing piece. Her recovery got the upgrades. Her tether grab could now help her recover. She could also wall jump and had a better hitbox on her up special. Her recovery got much, much better. Because her recovery was good, her heavy armor and high weight class finally translated into more survivability. Her multi-hit moves arguably got worse in the melee engine, which didn't handle them well. But her down smash was now a much better option and her aerials were about as good at spacing and taking stocks as in 64. The addition of spot dodge has done a lot for her offense and defense in Melee too. Then there's the missing piece, the missiles. The added side special gave Samus a key zoning and pressure tool which was especially effective in the early meta. Wes helped to pioneer the early Samus meta. In particular, he highlighted some good options like spot dodge down smash. He'd even found hints of advanced modern Melee like crouch cancel down smash. And Samus's many tether grab shenanigans. He'd also juiced up the character's recovery. At that time, Wes played Samus in a campier, more zone-heavy style that worked better in the early meta, especially on the East Coast. For a while, East Coast tournaments were 5 stock and sometimes lacked a timer. Even without timers and 4 stocks, the early meta favored Samus. Her weight class was especially good in the US, where players didn't know how to DI early on. Her floatiness made some confirms harder to land, too. As time wore on, a West Coast Samus rose up to challenge Wes. That was Hugs. In perhaps one of the most defining moments of Melee, the two Samus mains met at FC3 in the East Coast vs. West Coast crew battle. The crew battle would settle the biggest regional beef Smash as an eSport has ever seen. It would also cement the crew battle format Smash has today. The fulcrum of that battle may have been the Samus ditto between Hugs and Wes. Wes had just one stock to spare. Hugs, the new Samus on the block, just needed to close out. But Wes had other ideas, surviving up to 169%, turning the tables, and taking two stocks. Wes took six stocks total and gave the East the momentum they'd need to beat players like Isaiah and Ken. Wes had also proven himself to be the standout Samus, but the tides would turn in 2007 at EVO. Hugs had won the battle with Wes before EVO even began. EVO had regional qualifiers at the time, and Hugs had qualified where Wes hadn't. At the main event, 
Pugs would win the war. EVO 2007 is, to date, the best any solo Samus player has done at a Smash Major. Pugs would beat PC Chris and Mango to get into Grand Finals on winner's side. This was particularly insane because PC Chris was one of the best players of the era. Mango was a notable up-and-comer, like Hugs, but at the time he played Puff, an absolutely awful matchup for Samus. Hugs, known for his work ethic at the time, came in with strong wave dashes and movement, crisp reactions, and great survival skills which he used to 2-0 Mango. Ken would come up from an insane loser's run to challenge Hugs. Hugs took a game, but this tournament was Ken's chance to leave a lasting legacy on Melee, so Ken played his heart out and won. In the coming years, Samus would fall off. The era of the Five Gods was beginning. Melee was getting faster and more technical. Samus struggled to keep up and slipped into the mid-tiers. However, in 2010, the bounty hunter got a stroke of luck. A Florida player named Plup picked the character up. It was a surprise given Plup's style. Plup was insanely fast and played aggressively. He would have fit a lot of top tiers very well, but he loved the Metroid games too much to play anyone but Samus. As a side note, another Melee Samus player named Esam rose up in the Florida scene around the same time. Both Esam and Plup were strong players, but Esam's focus was primarily Brawl, so Plup was the new player to don the power suit. By 2013, he'd outrank Hugs 27th to 47th. The climb continued into 2014, where he reached 16th. He'd beat top players like Hacks Money and get 4th at CEO and 9th at EVO, and he'd take the title of Best Samus in a 3-0 Salty Sweet win over Hugs. At this time, other notable Samus players began to rise as well, like Duck, one of the best modern Samuses, and Quicksilver, Germany's best Samus. However, in 2015 and on, Plup found that Samus didn't have the firepower to take down the main bosses of Melee. He'd start learning Sheik, then eventually Fox. But he wasn't quite done with Samus yet. He'd give Samus another legendary EVO run. At EVO 2014, he'd land fourth and give Samus her best set in Melee history when he beat Lethin. He'd showcase just how strong Samus could be when played fast, aggressive, and optimal. He took two stocks and 30 seconds. After 2015, Plup gradually phased Samus out, but he'd still occasionally crank out an insane solo Samus run, like at Shine 2017 where he beat Lethen again, nearly beat S2J in the very tough Falcon matchup, and got fifth at a major. Plup had given Samus a second life in Melee. He'd made the matchup against the Spaceys look winning at points, and he used shield drops, hard hit tech chases, and big offstage punishes to make Samus look viable. Not top tier, but maybe, with good bracket luck, viable enough to win a major. After all, three different solo Samus players have come very close to top 10 in the ranks. Hugs, Plup, and Duck. In modern Melee, that dream seems distant for the Chozo Chosen One. Hugs has turned to focus on content creation, and Duck hasn't been playing as often. New Samus mains like Violence and Morse Code have risen up, but in 2020 Melee, Samus feels too slow to keep up. In Brawl, Samus would actually split into two characters, Zero Suit Samus and Samus Classic. We'll be sticking to Samus Classic, who, fittingly, felt like half of her old self. That's saying something because, even in Melee, she was just mid-tier. Brawl had nerfed Samus pretty heavily. The knockback of nearly every one of Samus's moves was significantly worse. Multi-hits were easier to SDI or fall out of as well, and almost every aerial had too much knockback to combo and too little to kill. To make matters worse, she had bad damage too. The lack of combos was one thing, move staling was another. In Brawl, stale moves did significantly less damage. That really hurt Samus, who would have loved to spam more missiles and charge shots, but usually had to hold on to the charge shot because it was one of her few kill options. It wasn't all bad for Samus, though. Samus had a great neutral game. Her aerials had low lag, her missiles could cancel off platforms, and her Zare was very hard to punish and very disruptive. The problem was, it did 4%, it didn't really combo, and it could whiff small opponents. Her neutral is good enough that Mewtwo King puts her at mid-tier in his list, claiming she's undervalued. And that could be true, because the two best Samuses were international players, Quicksilver from Germany and YB from Japan. Tiers and rankings revolved around the US. But the harshest truth isn't that Samus got worse, it's that she got boring. Samus had some cool optimizations, like Zare platform cancels that made Zare literally lagless, and in the right moment she could look cool with snipes and down air edge guards, but 
Even at more realized potential, the character is mostly a Zarin missile machine that takes forever to clean out a stock. This was in a game with much cooler and better zoners to compete with, like Snake and ZSS. Kinda like Other M, the biggest shame wasn't the rating, it was Samus and how dull this normally awesome 6 foot 3 artillery tower of character had become. Samus ended Brawl's peak with a very low player base and with Quicksilver getting his best results as ZSS. At the start of Smash 4, Nintendo seek to fix Samus's main issue, Kill Power. They improved the knockback of several moves like Charge Shot, Screw Attack, and Back Air. Samus also seemed to fit better inside a game engine where defensive options had been buffed across the board. But none of that mattered as much as her early issues. Her combo game felt pretty lackluster, to the point where it looked like her aerials were minus on hit, her Zare wasn't as good, and her hitboxes had serious problems. They were visually deceptive at best, and outright non-functioning at worst. Once again, she was low tier. But Smash 4 had something Brawl didn't. Patches. Samus was one of the biggest benefactors of the brand new patch culture. She received upgrades and fixes until, by 2017, she rose all the way up to mid-tier. It also helped the players learn how her combos worked. Samus's options had changed a lot, and even longtime Samus players needed time to understand what was a punish and what was an overextension. Samus's kit wasn't always clear either. For example, Samus's jab didn't combo with itself, and even when it did, it was better to jab into a grab or a tilt. By 2017, Samus had also earned some serious wins, this time as a secondary. E-Sam had returned to the character and to great effect. Samus covered Pikachu's bad matchups, Mario, Ness, and Ryu, very well. Isem used Samus to absolutely rock the top Mario mains in Smash 4. Salem used Samus as a secondary as well, and the character was now popular enough to have a niche of strong regional players. Samus also had a lot of international popularity, like Afro Smash in the UK, Joker in Mexico, and YB and Parme in Japan. Samus carved out a pretty decent niche in Smash 4. It was, in no small part because, in Smash 4, Samus was cool again. By patch 1.1.5, Samus had combos again. Samus could tech chase and pressure again. Samus could go surprisingly deep for edge guards. She even had some really cool shield break techniques. She could use her floatiness in Smash 4's great air dodge to break out of combos. Her bombs could also break her out of disadvantage. Offensively, she had a lot of tricks that made her lethal in advantage. And tons of potent tools for ledge trapping. In 2017, Isam even won Combo Breaker only using the Bounty Hunter. While the tournament was only a C tier, it was still impressive and a big win for Samus. Samus remained somewhere in mid tier because her disadvantage could be rough and she had some bad meta matchups like Bayonetta. But Nintendo had gradually returned Samus to her normal Smash post as that weird, cool looking mid tier with unique and head turning punishes. With Smash 4 in the books and a new game coming out, Nintendo had more experience designing the famous Space Warrior than ever. Surely now they could nail it right out of the gate and make their landmark sci-fi character cool and effective. Or they could nerf several kill moves, put her in an engine that suits Zumbreakers, and hope for the best. Samus probably got it the worst. From playing her at E3, I thought her kit was rather lackluster. Character doo doo. She don't do nothing. Once again, Samus would start off as one of the worst characters in the game. There were quite a few problems, like the flat nerfs she took. A lot of moves that used to kill, now did not. A lot of moves that used to combo, now also did not. The worst of both worlds being dash attack. In Smash 4, the move was a go-to combo starter and even a potential KO option. Now it was neither. She also had some multi-hit problems that plagued early ultimate and hurt her up smash and forward air. But this was mini-boss stuff for Samus. The real end boss she had to beat was the game's engine. At first, she seemed hard hit by Ultimate's changes to defensive options. Running away and zoning wouldn't be nearly as easy now. Her floatiness and bombs also didn't help her as much in an engine where air dodging was much more punishable. Even if she escaped some combos, she had to come down eventually. To make matters worse, most of the cast had gotten faster and gotten disjoints to help juggle and punish landings. Samus looked outgunned and outmatched. And worst of all, Samus still had her boring and unpopular other M design. Boo this suit and its generic smooth edges! Bring back Chunky Samus! 
Suit visuals aside, Metroid as a series scored a huge win in Ultimate. Ridley and Dark Samus were long awaited and much appreciated by Metroid fans. Perhaps the new Metroid hype helped with the Bounty Hunter's player base too. Despite her low rank, she kept her notable players and got an old one back. Quicksilver, now named Quick, had played ZSS in Smash 4. In Ultimate, he returned to his main from the Melee days. And he'd do pretty well pretty early, getting 17th at Prime Saga, an A-tier event, and getting around top 8 at big European tournaments. He wasn't the only one either. Joker from Mexico and YB and Parme from Japan had stuck to the character and gotten decent results. YB actually got 13th at Prime Saga. In the US, Advo and Icy Mist got solid results as well. By the middle of 2019, Samus rose up to mid-tier. This time, the upgrade wasn't coming from the patches as much as it was coming from the players. Samus did see a buff to her missile range, but more importantly, she got a lot of labbing from a global federation of Samus mains. Moves like forward air controlled a huge amount of space and were hard to punish. And Charge Shot was even better at punishing landings now that air dodges weren't as safe. Charge Shot also had new combos depending on percent and charge. And Charge Shot can cover roll and normal getup at the ledge and it could still kill pretty well. So could the old down air back from Smash 64. Samus also still had certain strengths like a great frame 4 defensive up special, a useful Zare, and some up air combos. Samus's main issues in mid-2019 were a lack of easy-to-land kill options and a pretty rough disadvantage state. But her damage, ledge trapping, and advantage state got her to mid-tier on a lot of lists. If you ever looked at European tier lists, you'd see Samus in her best spot in Smash history, high tier. It was mostly because of Quick. The best Brawl Samus in the world had not only returned, but became the best Ultimate Samus too. He showed how relentless Samus could be in advantage and around the ledge. He maximized Samus's combo game, getting a lot of damage off of very small openings, and he was cleanly beating every European player except Gluttony. This was all before a huge set of buffs as well. At the start of 2020 in patch 7.0, they gave Samus enough firepower to face all the creatures and characters in high tier. She got knockback buffs to up smash, down smash, and most importantly, dash attack and up throw. The up throw buffs meant opponents couldn't safely shield against Samus at high percents, and the dash attack buffs made small charge shot dash attack an easy kill confirmed. Zare also got hitbox buffs that helped her approaches and gave her new ways to open opponents up. The buffs seemed to help. Not long after them, Parme scored a 2-0 upset on T, the Japanese Link main currently ranked 15th on the PGRU. Now, Samus has settled somewhere between high mid and high tier. She's potentially better than she's ever been in any Smash game. And, in the hands of a top player in an offline environment, she's actually pretty cool. Her charge shot gives her a super diverse and potentially optimizable combo tree. Her superb advantage and rough disadvantage means that sets can go very back and forth. After 7.0, all those cool looking hitboxes pack a real punch too. Samus might even jump up to top tier and join her zero suit self. Without buffs, it'd be a long shot, but Samus is good at making those. Plus, Samus could get those buffs. Nintendo has buffed high mid-tiers before, and patch culture really favors Samus since Nintendo never knows what to do with her right off the bat. Even if Samus never makes top tier, she represents Metroid pretty well. Just like in the Metroid series, Samus changes a lot from game to game in subtle ways. She isn't the most successful, but she's influential and vital to the game's design and history. And in the right hands, she's not quite like any character Nintendo has ever made. Now that you've learned about all the variations of Samus, which one do you think is the most hype? Do you think Ultimate Samus could be the first to make it to top tier? Let us know in the comments and subscribe if you'll want to learn more about Smash.